The following program is brought to you by the University of Alabama. Both these writers have strong connections to Bookmark, Wendy Reed as longtime producer and Jennifer Horn as the host's wife. More importantly, they have worked together to co-edit two volumes of essays on Southern women and spirituality, All Out of Faith and Circling Faith. In addition, each has published a volume of stories, Accidental Memoir by Reed and Tell the World You're a Wildflower by Horn. I spoke with Jennifer Horn and Wendy Reed in Studio A in Reese Pfeiffer Hall on the campus of the University of Alabama. Wendy, Jennifer, good to see you both. Thank you for coming in. Glad to be here. Thank right. you for having us. Jennifer, you came from Cottondale. Wendy, you came from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate it. Both of you are very familiar with the program bookmark for yep. different reasons, yep. but neither one of you has ever been on it before. So our viewers know nothing about you. So in a few words, tell me a little bit about yourself. Wendy, where, where are you from? Are you an Alabamian? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? I am uh, always was born here, lived here my whole life. Uh, lived, uh, born in Birmingham, went to Birmingham City Schools, then went to UAB, and then University of Alabama. Apart from living in Waverly for about two and a half <laughs> years, I've lived in Birmingham all my life. Jennifer, you're not an Alabamian. Nope. I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, went to grade school and um, high school there, and then I went to Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas for um, college. Um, I had a brief stint in journalism school in Missouri, figured out that was not for me, and came to Tuscaloosa for the MFA in creative writing, and I have been here ever since. Right. Well, you are both writers. You're both writers of fiction, and Jennifer has written a good deal of poetry as well. And we'll talk about your individual books in due course, but the reason you're here together is because you are the co-editors of two volumes of essays that the University of Alabama Press has put out, All Out of Faith and Circling Faith. Now, faith is in both titles, and the books are about faith, or the lack of it, and religion, and spirituality, and in we'll get to kind of um, defining what's meant by those different terms, but let's start at the beginning. Why was there a first book? Who's, whose plan was that, and how did it come about? Wendy started it. It's all my fault. Yeah. What did you do? I was actually working on a documentary um, at the Center for Public Television and Radio um, called Rebels in the Pulpit, and I was interviewing um, Wayne Flint, uh, Alabama historian, um, extraordinaire and I asked for a book that had women dealing with faith and religion uh, so that I could read through it a bunch of different stories and he said I don't think there is such if you want that you'll have to make that oh and so I credit Wayne Flint with it oh, all right with, but you didn't want to do it alone apparently <laughs> definitely not so I co-opted Jennifer yeah, and we didn't know each other that well at the time. We knew each other kind of around literary world mm -hmm. in Tuscaloosa and Alabama. Um, but I had done uh, an anthology of poetry, so I had a little experience doing that. And also it just sounded like a great idea that would be fun to work on. And I think one of the best reasons to do a book is that you want there to be such a book and it doesn't exist. And so we just jumped in with both feet and did it. All right. it these are essays by women about varieties of religious experience, all women. And had there been, Wendy, had there been books of essays by men? I mean, you said, Wayne Flint said, and you said there was no such book about women, but was there one about men at all? I didn't look. I don't know. So you can look that up and get back with me. Maybe some, sure. somewhere down the road you must 
imagine that men have spiritual experiences too and perhaps put a book together of essays by men. People actually did suggest that to us, <laughs> um, men especially, but really, you know, men have bought this book and read it and enjoyed it as well. Mm. So even though it focuses on women and we're women and that was our interest and women have traditionally not been um, treated well um, in a lot of patriarchal um, religions, um, I think I think men found things to think about. Yeah. Well, the book, the first book and the second one, the huge majority of <clears throat> women in a place like Alabama or women in the South are Baptist Methodists, Presbyterians, some Episcopalians, and a few Catholics. And most, most women of faith are kind of conventional, but the essays in your book, for, we could say books because the second one is not radically different from the first one. And the idea of these essays is that these women are pursuing, in a sense, alternate paths. What, how, do you, how do you describe the, the, the non-traditional nature of these essays? Jennifer? Well, we felt like there was plenty out there for people who were traditionally Christian especially and, and happy in that religion. And it was the people who weren't um, still a part of a religious structure or didn't feel totally comfortable in those structures that tended to feel like they were the only ones, like nobody else felt like they did. And so we thought, well, we'll get all these people together and then people will be able to read and reflect and get an idea that there are a whole lot of different ways to be spiritual, but not necessarily conventionally religious. Um, in the first book we had a cantor, um, Jessica Roskin, and uh, an Episcopal priest, Pauli Murray. There were, those are the only two conventionally religious right, people. Right, one Jewish, one Roman Catholic. One Episcopalian. One Episcopalian, yeah. right. Yeah, and Ro <coughs> Roman Catholics still haven't gotten there yet. But, um, <laughs> but uh, there was a Baptist Buddhist, um, Jan Willis. Uh, there were people who felt themselves to be very spiritual but not allied with any particular religion. Um, a lot of people who found uh, spirituality in nature, but because we were talking to a lot of writers, a lot of writers, um, I think about Jeannie Thompson's essay where she said that writing poetry is often a transcendent act for her. So mm -hmm. there's a real connection between creativity and spirituality. I will bet that every individual who's given it any thought at all makes a distinction in his mind between the religious and the spiritual. They are not the same thing. Wendy, for you, what what is the the distinction in your head between spirituality and religion? I think that's an interesting, you said many people have thought about the distinction. Um, in teaching my English 102 class just this week, someone used them synonymously and I pointed out, yeah. do you think they are in fact synonyms, religion and, and spirituality? And they said, well, yes. And uh -huh. so I had an opportunity to talk again about this book in a different way. Right. But religion is a set of conventions, it's a set of rules, it's often hierarchical, it's been institutionalized. Whereas sure. spirituality is something that's organic and personal. Uh, the word spirit comes is from um, spire, inspire, uh, perspire, um, you know. It's breath. breath. Exactly. So it's something that is organic to everything we do. It's not just a, a separate set of conventions. So you can have spirituality without religion. Right. I think we both think so, and we I think, think, I think so. our essayists think so too. And yeah. do you or your essayists think you can have religion without spirituality? Some of the most spiritual people I know aren't necessarily religious. Right. And some of the most religious people I know I wouldn't necessarily call spiritual. Oh, I, I agree. So. I, I, was, I mean, that is part of the motivation for these essays. Women who feel themselves to be in some way spiritual and inspired, but do not feel themselves to be a part of any religious system at all. Were these essays that you, um, did you read widely and find them, or did you find the people and ask them to write the essays? How yes, did, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Plus. which did you do first? <laughs> do you know what you did first? We came <clears> to <throat> it with, with pieces that we liked already, mm -hmm. but then we uh, invited authors to contribute, and 
we were surprised at the response. What was it? It was very positive. <laughs> People were They eager. said yes. Yeah, I mean, we, yes. we only had, you know, a small honorarium to offer, and um, nevertheless, some really big writers said, yes, I want to write something, or yes, you can use this piece that, that I've written. Um, it was sometimes uh, when the time is right for a project, everything just falls into place, right. and everybody got on board, and the UA Press got on board, and um, suddenly we had two books. Yeah. Did you have the feeling... I mean, I know one does not read minds, but did you have the feeling, spiritual feeling perhaps, that when you, some of these women you contacted had wished that someone, that they had wanted to write about their, their particular spiritual position in the world, but no one had asked them or the opportunity had not arisen and you were fortuitously just happened to be at the right place at the right time? Is that a sense that you had at all, or am I making that up? Um, I don't know. It's hard to know. People certainly seem to have things to say. So yes. I think, yes, the, the you know, the, the syrup was flowing when we tapped the tree. I think yeah. it, it's, speaking to that is the fact that we had the first collection done and people were still saying and coming up to us, hey, mm -hmm. we would like, or we know somebody. And uh, so I feel like there was definitely the desire for, for the women out there to put out their voices in a way that hadn't been heard before. How many essays in the first book? How many, 16. Oh, how many in the second? I'm not sure, I think 17. Right, there are no repeats though from author no. or essay. No. no. No, they're all, the second book is, is, is all new. Mm -hmm. I won't ask you because it's always so horrible to say which one did you like the best, but which essay in either book struck, would you say to a, to a listener is, the, is the, the most unusual one or the most, oh, I won't say bizarre, but, but the, in a sense the farthest out, the one that the one that you think, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. I didn't know people thought that or believed that. Which one was it for you, Jennifer? Hmm. <laughs> it, you it would be hard to say sort of, the, I, I think I'd rather say like one that um, spoke to me in terms of saying something that I hadn't quite uh, verbalized or acknowledged. I love Sina Jeter Naslin's essay, mm -hmm. When Woods Are Dark, in the first book because she really talks about the aesthetic component of spirituality. And I think lots of times we think about religion and spirituality as being good or being virtuous or um, sort of rules for how to live. And this included the idea that, that beauty is a really important part of spirituality oh. and would be um, a, a reason to be drawn to practices of religion or spirituality, that there's a strong aesthetic component to it. I, I can see why that would appeal to you particularly. Yes. Wendy, did you have a, an essay in either book that you thought, well, this, this is different even from the other ones which are different? When people ask me about the, um, the different essays, I like to say what types of authors we have. We mm -hmm. have a tap dancing astrophysicist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have the Baptist Buddhist. We have um, a fishnet wearing tattooed Episcopalian priest. So. They're all, they're all characters and they're all unique personalities. But in the first collection, one of the essays that spoke to me early on was by Sue Monk Kidd. She's, she's been on Bookmark. Uh, many people have read The Secret Life of Bees. Mm -hmm. But before that, she was in a very conventional religious life. And she wrote a book about that. And there's a piece where she comes to visit her daughter at work and her daughter's working in a drugstore on her knees stocking a bottom shelf and some men are saying that's how I like to see women you know, on their knees and it convicts her that they think that's so funny and the, the expression on her daughter's face it just you know so I think when I was doing Rebels in the Pulpit and the women who had so often in churches made the money and kept the churches going, but they weren't allowed to have positions of power. Mm -hmm. I think that spoke to me um, because of the time of working on that particular documentary. But whatever speaks to me or whatever's unusual changes day to day, depending on, you know, right. depending on me. 
Yeah, some of these essays are by women who are, in a sense, a, a religious institution of one. They are simply a spiritual individual. And then others, as you've both suggested, are by women who are, in a way, still in religious institutions. They just are t taking a slightly different approach or t have a different sense of their own place in it. You, you had a, um, you were no sooner finished with volume one than people wanted to, there to be a volume two. I suppose <laughs> I should ask, is there going to be a volume three? I think there probably <laughs> will be somewhere down the line. We were six years between uh -huh. the first one and the second one, so right. if we have another one out by 2018, we'll be right. on track. I think we need a trilogy. Surely yeah. there's that many varied voices. A trinity. Uh -huh. <laughs> a trinity. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. Definitely. Yes, and something, <laughs> faith at last, or no more faith, or <laughs> yeah. something for the third one. Finish it off. Well, as we began, Finish. you are each, each one of you, in her own right, is an author. Wendy, you have a book, <clears throat> Accidental Memoir, and am I right that this is a mixed genre, that some of the pieces are, are there is, the, the title piece is reportage, is it not? It's, the, it's, it's not made up. It's a memoir. A memoir, and then there are. It's been called a gender bend. I mean, gender bender. It's been called <laughs> it's a, a genre bender. A genre bender. <laughs> so. But it, so there are really stories that identi are identifiable as short fiction, and then there's the the accidental memoir itself, which is a uh, was a very difficult must have been a very difficult thing to write. It was about an accident that you had. Correct. What happened? In the accident, yeah. or the the book no, putting the it together, um, the in 1996, I was driving down I-65 uh, with my son buckled in the back seat. I put my SUV in um, cruise control, and it was raining, and a hydroplane. So mm -hmm. I went across the interstate, through the median, and into oncoming traffic. There was a wreck, and somebody oncoming was killed, yes. yes? Yes. And this changed her life a lot, but it changed yours profoundly for, for quite a long time. The most traumatic event of your life, I would guess. Indeed. The, uh, the accident, then the wrongful death charges that followed made for a, um, yeah, a, a stressful tough couple time. of years. Yeah. But you have, I've, of course, I know your book, and I know the short stories in it also. And I do not mean to make light of your as really My dark dreadfully humor. traumatic event, but a lot, of the of the, a lot of the fiction in your book is humorous fiction about cadavers. Guilty. <laughs> you have a lot of death stories in your book. You have a story in which a mortician dances with a corpse. You have a story about a woman who's dying and wishes her husband to, to, to be her mortician. Um, yes. <clears throat> do you have any idea why this happens? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. The publisher who originally wanted to do the book saw a connection between what I was going through and the fact that I had started the creative writing program at UAB while in in during the circumstances and how that informed all the work that I did writing at that point. So he yeah, saw the connection. Yeah. I didn't. And I still think it's a little bizarre. But well, I do have, I have, a, I'm a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. I, right. I like the bizarre. And Flannery O'Connor. I like the bizarre and the macabre and the Southern Gothic. So. Well, there you are. It's a. And you had at one point worked on a uh, documentary on morticians? Four and a half feet under. They're <laughs> not really buried six feet, it's four and a half feet. So I got to hang out with three people becoming funeral directors, morticians. Is the four and a half foot level the bottom of the casket or the top? That's how, di that's how deep that's they how go. That's how deep the hole is. Oh, well, it seems deep enough. No one's going to escape. So. <laughs> and... Let me, uh, well, no, I'll get back to you. Jennifer, you have um, an anthology of poetry. You have Bottle Tree, a collection, uh, your own collection of poems. But most recently, you have Tell the World 
Your Wildflower, which is a collection of short stories. Um, again, like the anthologies, these are stories all in the voices of females. I won't say women because they're not. Tell me about it. Well, some are girls, <laughs> um, as what's you the, suggest. What's the littlest one? The youngest is probably around seven or eight, uh -huh. um, and then the oldest is, you know, maybe 80. Um, I didn't come up with exact um, no. ages, but they, they run the gamut, and um, the book is organized chronologically from the youngest voice to the oldest voices. And, you know, I, I always enjoyed writing persona poems um, as a poet, and I think the first person story was kind of a natural extension of that. Um, I like getting in voice and staying in voice and imagining what it's like to be that person. Um, and mm. in the story, it's imagining what it's like to be that person in a particular situation, interacting with other people. One, this, this is a question that uh, fiction writers are always asked. Of course, you have been a seven-year-old girl. You have not been a, an 80-year-old female. Is there, does it make, I mean, can... Not yet. <laughs> well, not yet is the right answer. But when you're working, say, you have these, how many stories? 20, 21, 22, how many are there? I think it ended up being 24, uh, yeah. And there, each one is uh, a different female voice, and there are all these different ages. Some of those ages you have been. Mm -hmm. You know what it feels like to be, to have been seven, or to have been 20, or to have been 25. But you, does it make any difference? You know, um, <clears throat> I can see why it would seem like mm -hmm. I might have to write differently than the seven-year-old, which I've been, with the 70-year-old, which I haven't been. But I have just always had a good sense of myself as a person of all ages. I feel like I know what it's going to feel like to be me older. I have a sense of myself as an older person, and I still have a strong sense of my childhood self. Um, and I love kids, and I love old ladies, I think, because they're both honest in their own ways, and they're both um, not fully conventionalized or old ladies maybe have become deconventionalized, and so I especially enjoyed those voices. Um, I don't know, I just think it's all about the imagination, and you put yourself in that place, and you use what you've observed and heard, and you know, then maybe it works. Well, children are honest because they don't know any better. Right. And people past 70, I can assure you, pretty much speak their mind because they feel they have nothing to lose. <laughs> So what is the most dishonest age for a woman? Ooh. Hmm. You want to get question. help from Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> Can I call a friend on that one? Yeah. I don't know. It must, I mean, I, I, I don't know either, but it must have something to do with an age at which you care the most about how you're perceived and what people think of you and, and your ambitions in this world. What do you think about that, Wendy? I have thinking of the E.E. <laughs> e. Cummings quote uh, about uh, growing older, becoming who I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, unlike Jennifer, haven't always had a strong sense of self. I, there are lots of me's. Like I'm, I feel slightly schizophrenic and all the different me's there are. But as I grow older, I think it matters less what other people think. And it's more fun, I think, to um, be deconventionalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well less, to less, be more less need for a persona, less need for for uh, a facade of any sort, that just say what you think and yeah. hope but, for the best. But honestly, it can get you into trouble. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. At any, at any age. At any age. It's stuck in my mouth half the time. Well, let us assume for a moment that you two do go forward and co-edit um, another volume of essays on by Southern women on spirituality. You also have independent projects. Wendy, what, what do you see down the road as the next thing you'd like to be doing? Um, well, writing-wise, I hope to work on a historical novel about Tuscaloosa and the University of Alabama and the yeah. originator of the journalism department. Clarence Kaysen. He supposedly shot himself in this building that we're sitting in right now, but I don't know. What if somebody goes back and checks evidence and there's more of a mystery there than we know? Well, that would be just fine for you, and I don't think Clarence Kaysen will care. I think it would be a good story. I think it's a good project. 
and and it has a certain amount of name recognition built in and and a certain amount of mystery and it is after all a homicide well and it's a death in any case and historical which so is in keeping with your interests well <laughs> is there a thread <laughs> Yes. I seem so sunny though, don't I? <laughs> you do. <laughs> I like it's, mysteries. It's a nice day for a funeral. <laughs> and Jennifer, what, what are you up to next? I always have more projects that I want to do than I can possibly do in this lifetime. But um, there's a new book of poems coming out next year from Salmon Press in Ireland. I'm oh, very good. excited about. Um, a Little Wanderer. Um, uh, Wendy and I may co-edit another book. Um, there's a collection called Bell's Letters that you and I are co-editing um, fiction by Alabama women. Um, that'll probably be out in a year. And then I have a long-term project of uh, what I'm calling a personal biography of the writer Sarah Mayfield, a uh, childhood friend of Zelda. Um, and it's gonna be about Sarah, but it's also gonna be about Southern women and art and um, societal pressures. Uh, mm. And so I'm hoping to have that out in a couple of years. Most of those things I knew about, but there's something that I thought you were going to say that, that you didn't, and that is a number of people have asked me, and I know they've asked you as well, since they like the stories in Tell the World You're a Wildflower. And they are excellent. Are you not planning to write any more short stories? I am, and that's, that's one an, another one on the list. Um, I have, I don't know, maybe five or six new stories, and I'm kind of thinking that a new collection of short stories would loosely revolve around the idea of work. Um, oh. And so my, my title right now is Close Enough, as in Close Enough for Government Work. Okay. But we'll see. Maybe that in a couple of years, too. <laughs> All right. Well, the Clarence Cason Affair and Southern, <laughs> have Southern Women and Work. Thank you both. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Don. Bye-bye.